On May 25th, 2008, a storm complex that had already wreaked havoc across the High Plains moved into the upper Midwest. By the end of that day, a small town just northwest of Waterloo, Iowa, would become cemented in tornado history. My name is Ethan Moriarty. I'm a mechanical engineer with a fascination in tornado damage forensics. This is a damage analysis of the Parkersburg EF5. Before we get into the damage analysis of the tornado itself, Let's first look into a brief history and get into the meteorological breakdown that allowed this tornado to take place. As mentioned earlier, this tornado took place on May 25th, 2008, as a part of a multi-day severe weather outbreak across the central United States. In the days prior, a notable tornado took place in Windsor, Colorado, achieving an EF3 rating. Northern Colorado isn't typically known for large tornadoes, but this mile-wide tornado went down as one of the largest tornadoes in Colorado state history, making this severe weather outbreak particularly notable before the Parkersburg event even took place. By the morning of the 25th, the surface low associated with this system was over the upper Midwest, over the states of Minnesota, North Dakota, reaching into Canada as well. The warm front with this surface low was oriented north-south and reaching into the Midwest, while behind it was a cold front crashing in from the plains. In between the two fronts was a potent warm sector that was composed of very high dew points and instability that ranged to 3,000 joules per kilogram. While the northern storms in Minnesota were past the warm front, Right around the triple point, a storm in northern Iowa would eventually use that warm front as a convergence zone. This supercell would be the one that would spawn the Parkersburg EF5, and it took full advantage of said warm front. Parkersburg was struck relatively early on in the tornado's life cycle, and the tornado would make a direct impact with the south side of town, significantly damaging many homes and businesses, including the town's high school. Further downstream, the town of New Hartford would miss a direct hit, though one of the sub-communities further north would receive a direct hit, damaging several homes, some of which to EF5 status. After New Hartford, the tornado would continue for another 25 miles over mostly farmland, though several more homes and farmsteads were hit before the tornado dissipated 43 miles from its origin point. In terms of human casualties, there were 70 reported injuries, and unfortunately, there were also 9 fatalities, 7 of which were in Parkersburg, 2 in New Hartford. The heart of Parkersburg was the most significantly impacted area from this tornado, several buildings receiving EF5 level damage indicators. The housing development in New Hartford that was also struck also saw one EF5 damage indicator assigned. With the tornado history and statistics out of the way, let's dive into the damage analysis. Let's first take a look at some of the foundations of the homes that were in Parkersburg. Many of the foundations in Parkersburg were constructed of concrete masonry unit blocks. These CMU blocks are used to pour concrete around them as they provide an able foundation for the house to be built upon. Oftentimes with these foundations, there is also rebar that is placed in order to maintain the stiffness of the foundation. When looking through some of the images of the foundations from the National Weather Service survey, I found this image. We could see that this photo here has a rebar reinforcement of this foundation completely sheared. So I wanted to figure out how much force it took to shear that stock of rebar. Dropping into our sketch pad here, we're going to quickly just draw out a, you know, a quick little cross section of our rebar here. So, you know, this is the area that this is gonna shear in this little cross section here. 
From what I was able to measure from the image, this appears to be a number four stock rebar, which is roughly 0.5 inches in diameter, so a half inch in diameter. This is the diameter symbol, by the way. Uh, it's commonly used uh, in engineering documents, this kind of zero with a slash through it. In order to shear something, we obviously have to have a force acting on it in this direction, so not axially through the rebar, but rather against and shearing through the rebar stock. So of course we're gonna have an equal and opposite reaction of this rebar stock since this is kind of cemented into the foundation. So this part's not allowed to move. So it's being pushed from this side and the anchoring of it is going to counteract that force. That's just Newton laws at work there. As we talked about in the last damage analysis video, I talked a lot about engineering specifications and standards and rebar is no different. It has standards to adhere to. So the material property or the rating that the material is able to survive is something that's very important, obviously. According to the spec for this rebar, it needs to be able to meet a yield stress. So the stress that the material is able to withstand without permanently deforming at 60,000 PSI. And then there's an ultimate strength, which is the strength of fracturing at 90,000 PSI. So what that means in the grand scheme of things, if we have a stress versus strain graph, so strain is the amount of deflection that takes place, and stress is the internal pressures that are subjected to the part when you're applying forces on them. With steel, you're gonna have, you know, kind of like a curve like this almost. So you have your initial yield stress, which is your sigma y, and then you have an ultimate strength, which is higher up, which is your ultimate stress. When you reach your yield stress, the part is no longer able to deform back to its original shape. So if you achieve stresses anywhere in this region, that is called elastic. So think of like a rubber band, you stretch it and it goes back to its original shape. So that's the elastic region. And then after that over here is your plastic region. So anything past the elastic and into the plastic, the part is never going to return to its original length. So say if you're pulling on it, for example, right? You know, you're pulling on it in these two directions, you're tensely loading the, the bar and you exceed the yield strength. Say if it had an original length of this long, you know, after you exceed that yield, say you end up over here on the strain side of the equation, you might return somewhere over here because you're never going to be able to get fully back and it's going to end up being a length like that. So like maybe a little bit less. So strain, like I said, is your change in length basically versus the stress that's on it. So this is the relationship between the two and that's how we get our ultimate and yield stresses. Now it's important to note that this is how the material behaves in the axial direction. We're looking at shear, which is a little bit different, but we can get our shear, which we use the letter tau for, those yield stresses and ultimate stresses from these values. There's an approximate value, it's about the, you know, your principal stress over, or I should say axial stress over the square root of three. And that's the, that's the same for both here. So for the yield, that's going to be 34,600 PSI. And for the ultimate, that is going to be 52,000 
PSI. As we saw in our image, we know that rebar completely sheared. So it fractured, meaning we need to use the ultimate stress. So this is the stress that we're going to be testing our criteria to. Giving ourselves a little bit more space here. Let's calculate how much force is needed. So stress is force over area. So in order to get our force, we need the area since we already know what the stress is going to be. In this case, it's going to be tau average. There's a little bit more nuance to it, but I'm using approximate values here for simplicity's sake, uh, but it would yield us a very similar answer. So now that we know that, in order to get the force, we multiply A to the other side. A little bit of math and algebra here. It's not too crazy, I promise. Equals our force. The area, so that's where that diameter is going to come into play. So we know we have our 52,000 PSI. And then we're going to multiply that by the area, which if we remember from our geometry class, the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. So we know the diameter, so we're gonna do uh, the diameter, the 0.5 inches over two squared. And this is going to yield us a result of our force at 10,210 pounds force. Roughly 10,000 pounds were subjected into that piece of rebar there in order to shear it like that. Yeah, we're not talking in the axial direction, you know, pulling on it the way that rebar is intended, but rather shearing it right across the middle. Now, obviously there was probably a wall or something that was attached to this foundation that subjected the load to that. So there was probably a moment arm. So basically like a giant lever that is adding exorbitant amounts of force into it so it's not like there's just a point load being applied to the rebar that's shearing it in half there's obviously a lot of moment that's being put into the system in order to shear off that and probably other sections of rebar we just have the close-up of this picture here in this instance so it's probably distributed throughout other sections of the foundation but i thought it was cool to show just how much force it takes to do that and we're going to get into it a little bit more later on, just how impressive some of the forces are even distributed across an entire wall. With that first warm up example out of the way, if you will, let's dive into some damage that occurred at the Parkersburg High School. With that said, I'm quickly going to point out that I am referencing the figure and some information that was found in Tim Marshall's official damage report on the Parkersburg tornado. Tim Marshall, of course, being an expert in severe damage. He's a professional engineer and meteorologist as well. So he is an incredible resource when it comes to tornado damage analysis. So I'm going to be referencing something that he found in his report that occurred at the Parkersburg High School, but I'm going to go into a little bit more depth to explain why the failure occurred. Looking at this figure, we can see that it's labeled windows and hinge line. This appears to be some sort of classroom environment in the back here based on the blackboard. But this entire wall looks to be pushed over and into this classroom environment, which during school sessions, that would be pretty terrifying if you're in a tornado warning and your entire school wall is collapsing around you. But there's a reason as to why this wall collapsed and there's a reason why we shelter in the innermost areas of a building including a well-built school like this one so let's dive into it quickly sketching out the you know the the wall real quick so we have this long section of wall where we have classrooms right and in this wall we had what looked to be almost floor to ceiling type 
windows distributed through the wall. So these are, you know, like these giant windows, I guess you could say, we'll just put little like cartoonish hatches through them in order to know that this is the windows. And then the rest of this is brick wall, right? So obviously you're gonna need windows in order to allow natural light into your building. Though sometimes it feels like school's a prison, it's not at the end of the day. So you want some ambient light coming into your classrooms. But in terms of construction, when you have a bunch of wind loading taking place across your wall and exorbitant amounts of it, especially in the case of a tornado, there is an issue when it comes to these breaks in the wall. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a giant cross section through this wall. So this is kind of a little like little indicator for the view that I'm kind of slicing through. I'm going to draw this straight up and down. Something like that. Okay, so we have, you know, a brick wall with interruptions of windows, right? You have your windows, brick wall, windows, right? Something along the lines of that and then brick wall continued. So what this means is that if we have a distributed load across all this, so just assuming that there is a uniform distributed load from the wind pushing on this wall, what does that mean at the areas where there's a difference between wall and glass? So obviously the walls and glass have different material properties. And what we can do here is sketch out these lines, these discontinuities, we can call them because they are sharp transitions. Whenever you have a sharp transition in a material, that is called a discontinuity. And this is going to play into my big example that I'm gonna talk about later in this video, so stay tuned. In terms of materials, discontinuities are not a good thing. If we're looking at, say, this calculator, for example, notice that a lot of areas that could have very sharp corners don't actually exist. Many times they're kind of smoothed over. These are called fillets, and this allows a gradual transition of surfaces. These gradual transitions are important because discontinuities, anything like sharp corners or areas where you don't have a nice flowing continuous surface are a good area for stresses to build up. We're gonna take a quick plot through here. So we're going to look at our old friend stresses here, uh, represented by sigma. And due to these discontinuities, you know, if this is, you know, increasing stress on this side, right? Over here at the end where we have our distributed load, it's the initial start of it. There's not much, but the more we go, the more stress we're gonna get. And then eventually we're gonna get to this wall. And then we have a sharp transition between the brick wall, which has one material property, and this glass, which has a different material property. So depending on how it behaves, it might go down like this and then grow, or it might go up like this and grow. But what's important to note is that there is a sharp jump in stresses. So it might do something like that. And then we're going back to brick, so it might jump back down and then compound again with the distributed load. So either way, there are these sharp breaks that are occurring in the stresses. And this is where we're going to get really bad stress concentrations and where we're going to see failures in certain mechanical things. One of the most famous examples of critical stress concentration failures in mechanical engineering history is if we go back to the late 1940s and take a look at the de Havilland Comet. The de Havilland Comet was in a marvelous piece of engineering, and it allowed for planes to reach new heights, new speeds that hadn't been seen before in commercial aviation. However, pushing these new heights with this aircraft led a critical flaw to be exploited in the aircraft, which caused a number of crashes, and ultimately the de Havilland Comet having to be grounded for several months until the issue was figured out. The planes were crashing, and explosively decompressing at high altitudes because the windows on the airplanes were square. 
They had rectangular windows with sharp corners on the end. The pressurized body of the aircraft was obviously pushing out on the very thin atmosphere at the altitudes that the airplane was flying at. And the sharp corners of the windows allowed stress to build up in those windows and then eventually cause catastrophic failures at 40,000 feet, costing all lives aboard the aircraft. Eventually, the de Havilland Comet went back into service with round windows in order to get away from the stress discontinuities that were taking place in the material. Jumping back into the school here in Parkersburg, let's take a quick look at where the failures occurred. Looking back at this wind-loaded wall of the Parkersburg High School, we can see those sharp transitions between window and brick wall. And it's ultimately between a brick wall and a window where the failure took place. So down here, we can see those floor to ceiling windows, but at these two locations, somewhere in the middle of the wall where the stresses were being built up highest from that distributed load being dispersed across that wall, the most force is going to be on the middle of that wall. And it found two weak points where there were stress discontinuities that allowed the wall to fail and then ultimately fall over that hinge line. So when we look at tornado sheltering practices, there's a reason why we go to the most interior parts of a school. Exterior walls have stuff like windows that have these different areas and weak points that allow exterior walls to fail, whereas internal to buildings, you have more uniform wall structures, and especially in those inner hallways where there is going to be large stretches of continuous material that allow people sheltering to hunker down in compared to those exterior facing walls. Now that we've learned a little bit about stresses in materials as well as hinge lines and stress discontinuities, let's take a look at an EF5 damage indicator from the Parkersburg tornado. This here was a home that was constructed in 2008. So this home was not even a year old at the time of the tornado. From first glance, we can see that the home is completely swept away, but I wanna pay attention to what's happening over on the left side of the frame. Thankfully for us, we have a close up picture that we can look at. Here we can see a brick wall that has failed and started to cave in from the wind loading that was happening very close to the ground. Unlike the CMU foundation that we saw earlier, this house's foundation is constructed from solid concrete blocks, which is significantly stronger than CMU foundations. Though it may not seem overly impressive at first, to me this is one of the most fascinating damage indicators from this event. And the reason why is because this wall is extremely low to the ground and not that big in surface area. What I mean by the surface area is the area that's exposed to the wind acting as that lever that we were talking about earlier pushing on the wall. In the school's case, for example, that was a huge wall that so much wind was able to push on in order to push that wall over. In this case, this wall doesn't appear to be any more than three feet tall, and yet it has failed and started to cave in. So let's try to estimate the wind speeds that it would take to cause this concrete block wall to fail. In order to do this, we're going to do what is called a combined loading analysis. Combined loading is where we take a finite element on that wall and analyze all of the forces going into it to try to understand the principle and shear stresses that are being subjected to that wall. Starting with what's called a free body diagram, we're going to map out all of our forces on this and then try to figure out which ones are most potent and combine them in order to get a best sense of what is being subjected to the wall. Of course, the main load that's going to be taking place on this wall is the distributed load from the wind force. This force from the wind is going to be distributed across the entire wall, so it is important that we get a, a sense of the geometry of the wall. We didn't have an image to go off of to give us the depth of the wall from the perspective of the picture that we were giving, so we're going to estimate that the wall is 20 feet long and 30 some odd inches tall in order to calculate 
the platform area of the wall that our load is distributed through. Another important force to consider is the weight of the wall. This concrete wall is obviously going to be pretty heavy, so it's going to be resisting to some degree the force that's being pushed into it, though not too much. It appears that the moment arm is likely going to be the most potent factor in the failure of this wall. A moment, once again, is basically if you think of the wall as a lever. The further out on a lever you go, the more advantage you have to lifting or compromising a force on the other end. So thinking of the wall as a lever, that is the moment about the bottom of the wall. It's also important to note that at our stress element, we might also have some shear coming into play. So as we talked about earlier, shear is not an axial force through the wall, but rather what's going to be separating the wall across this direction of travel from the floor relative to the wall. The one thing to note about concrete is that it's very good in compression. So when there's a lot of weight on an object, that's why they're so frequently used for foundations but they're not good in tension. That's why there's oftentimes rebar to try to resist some of the tensile forces that exist in foundations. In this case, it appears that the mortar was the point of failure of the wall. So we're going to use the tensile strength of mortar in our analysis, which comes out to 150 PSI. To find the force due to the weight, we take the material properties of concrete and assume that this wall is entirely made of concrete of a uniform density. Though this is likely not the case, this is what we have to do for our approximation. We take the density of the concrete as well as the volume of the wall, so taking the length, width, and height of the wall in order to multiply those two values together in order to give us a mass of the wall. The mass times the acceleration due to gravity will give us the weight of the wall. In this instance, we estimate the wall's weight to be just over 4,000 pounds force. Considering the shear that's occurring, our stress element we have located at the outer exterior of the wall. This is important because shear acts more in the center of the object. So on either wall, the internal and external walls, the shear is going to be zero. Fortunately for us, shear being zero simplifies things greatly in terms of calculating the final stress. Finally, we have to calculate out the moment due to wind loading. Finally, let's analyze the moment due to the wind loading, the thing that we most care about, obviously. Moments are calculated by a force times a distance. In this case, because we have a distributed load across the wall, we can find the center and multiply the magnitude of that distributed load. So obviously the load is distributed across a certain length. So if we multiply the magnitude of the distributed load times the length, it gives us one big resultant vector for the force acting on the wall that's going to be acting on the center of the object. So that gives us both the length of the moment arm that's pushing on the wall, as well as the magnitude of the force, which in turn gives us the moment. We already know the failure criteria of the wall. Given the location of our little stress element that we are using, we know that because of the moment bending on the wall, that failure point is going to be in tension at that location. So we're going to be using the ultimate tensile strength of mortar. Stress due to a bending moment can be calculated using the moment times the distance to the neutral axis, which isn't really an important term. For the context of a rectangle, the neutral axis is in the center of the rectangle, so that simplifies things for us greatly. The multiplication of those terms is going to be divided by the area moment of inertia. In very simple terms, the area moment of inertia is going to take into account the shape of the object. Hey everyone, Future Ethan here, uh, the one that's editing this video currently, and I realized I made a couple mistakes in my math. So this next portion of the video is going to be a little jumpy, but I reevaluated everything. So the graphics that you're going to see on the screen that actually spell out the math are correct. But because I was referencing actual values when recording the video, I'm going to have to kind of cut around those as those numbers are no longer relevant. Hope you don't mind. In engineering, you make math mistakes, right? So that's why you got to check your numbers. All right.
back to it. Taking a cross section through our wall, fortunately for us again, the wall being a rectangle helps us out greatly in our favor in order to calculate the area moment of inertia so we can get that for our bending moment stress equation. Once again, the distance to the neutral axis, also simple because it's a rectangle, which helps us out greatly and again. Lastly, for our bending moment stress equation, we need the force that's imparted on the wall. Throwing it back to last video, we're going to go back to our old friend the drag equation in order to calculate out the force that's being imparted by the wind on the wall. Quickly, due to the weight of the wall though, we have to take into account the compressive stress and then counteract that from the tensile stress that we're trying to find. This gives us the real tensile stress failure criteria. So now we know that and a little bit of algebra, let's take the force equation for drag and then add that into our bending moment stress equation and rearrange things so we can solve for velocity. And ultimately find that the velocity subjected to this wall came out to th now obviously there are a lot of assumptions that were made and the geometry of the wall and the uniformity is not something that we can guarantee, but it is well above the EF5 threshold at the end of the day, making Parkersburg one of the most strongest tornadoes that we have seen in the United States history. So what are the lessons that can be learned by the Parkersburg EF5 tornado? If there's anything that some of the damage images show us, it's that even if you're in a basement, it's important to have head protection because you never know what could fall into your basement, especially in a tornado of the caliper that Parkersburg was. As pointed out by Tim Marshall, there were several homes that weren't adequately anchored. So even in EF2 level damage, homes were completely slid off of the foundation, exposing basements to tornadic winds. Another lesson to watch out for is walls that have discontinuities. So material changes, sharp corners, or changes in material of any kind, because those are locations that the wall could abruptly fail at, causing hinge line failures. And finally, as we saw with our last example, homes that have basements that are exposed to the open, obviously basements are the best place to be in the case of a tornado, but if there is an exposed foundation on either side of your house, make sure you're sheltering in an area that's completely covered with ground. As we saw, a powerful enough tornado can even push over basement walls. Thank you so much for tuning in to this installment of the Damage Analysis Series here on the June 1st YouTube channel. I hope you learned something today. And as always, stay safe in severe weather, and we hope to catch you in the next one.